everyone, and welcome to the latest episode of Are You Kidding Me? I'm Naomi Schaefer Riley, a resident fellow at the American Enterprise Institute. And this is Ian Rowe, also a resident fellow at AEI. Today we are joined by Dr. Patrick Wolf. He is a distinguished professor of education policy and the 21st Century Endowed Chair in School Choice in the Department of Education Reform at the University of Arkansas College of Education and Health Professions. Did I get all that right? Yes, you, you should get a gold star, Naomi. Okay. Well, today we are so excited that Patrick is joining us today because we are going to talk to him about a new report that he co-authored with some other folks, including one of our colleagues at AEI, Brad Wilcox. Can I also read the full name of the report? It's the Protestant Family Ethic. What do Protestant, Catholic, private, and public schooling have to do with marriage, divorce, and non-marital childbearing? So with that, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to let Ian start asking you questions because this is a fascinating topic and we're so excited to talk to our listeners about it today. Yeah, Patrick, it's great to have you. Thank you for joining us. As you may know, for the last decade, I ran a network of public charter schools in the heart of the South Bronx and the Lower East Side in Manhattan. And in this report, you write about this idea that most of the time when we're talking about schools and their outcomes, we're really interested in things like test scores, you know, reading and math graduation rates, which are obviously important, but your report actually seeks to answer a different kind of question, which is that there are other very important outcomes that we're seeking for children around character, family formation, marriage, and you do an interesting analysis of the type of school that yields better outcomes on those dimensions. So what are some of the findings that came out of the study and why did you embark upon this in the first place? I'll tackle the second question first, Ian. So basically, Brad Wilcox and his team had been studying marriage outcomes for a long time, and they were struck by the fact that there was so little consideration of the role that schooling might have played in people's marriage outcomes. I'm a school choice researcher, so I've been studying the effects of of different types of schools on student outcomes for a long time. And as you mentioned, Ian, you know, I've mainly focused on test scores, but also looked at educational attainment and some civic outcomes as well. When Brad reached out to me, he said, it looks like the people who study marriage don't look at schooling and the people who study schooling don't look at marriage. So, you know, it was sort of a marriage, a research marriage made in heaven (laughs) was my colleague Albert Chang and I, who study school choice, partnering with Brad Wilcox and Wendy Wang, who study marriage. And we found some very rich data sources on the schooling backgrounds of people and their marriage outcomes. So what we found was that people who had attended Protestant schools were twice as likely to be in an intact marriage as adults than their public school peers. How many years later? That's a good question, Ian. We drew upon two surveys. Our primary survey was the Understanding America survey, and it had 5,000 respondents, all adults. It was representative of the adult population in the United States. So these are adults from age 18 to age 90 in approximate proportion to their representation in the population. So that includes a broad sweep of time. You know, some of the folks, you know, were educated in the 50s and 60s some in the 2010s. A second survey that we drew from was the NELS, the National Longitudinal Survey of Youth, 97 cohort. These are millennials. These are the older millennials. And so that one is more a cohort study. The UAS data is really all adults across generations in the United States. And that's where we found our main results. We drew our main results from the more representative sample. And that's where we found this really strong performance in terms of marriage outcomes for people who had attended Protestant schools. Can I just ask, so what in this context should people be thinking about when they're thinking about a Protestant school? Is this typically evangelical or mainline? And are they concentrated in particular areas of the country? So overwhelmingly evangelical. We didn't have exact counts, but our sense is that the Protestant sample is about 80% evangelical. The rest, you know, mainline and some, you know, pretty specific kinds of Protestant affiliations, but basically that have schools, that run schools. You know, that's our Protestant sample. And so now what were some of the core findings? 
So yeah, we, we found that people who had attended Protestant schools were twice as likely to be in an intact marriage. And we defined an intact marriage as your first marriage. So you're in a marriage and it's your first marriage, twice as likely if you attended Protestant schools compared to public schools. And they were half as likely to have had a child out of wedlock than their public school peers. Catholic people who had attended Catholic schools were 30% less likely to have produced a child out of wedlock compared to their public school peers. But in terms of intact marriages, they were not very different in their rates of being in an intact marriage than public school graduates. And then when we looked at ever divorced, basically the people who had attended Protestant schools were 50% less likely to have ever been divorced in their adult lifetime. And that was similar for people who attended secular private schools, also 50% less likely to have ever been divorced. Basically, private schools in general, there was an association with better marriage outcomes, but the Protestant, people who had attended Protestant schools really stood out more consistently better marriage outcomes across all three of our measures, intact marriage, never divorced, and have not born a child out of wedlock. And also just the magnitude of the difference was just much greater for people of schooled in Protestant schools compared to the other schooling options. And to what do you attribute those differential outcomes? I think one thing that often isn't recognized is that schools communicate values to their students. I mean, whether they're trying to or not, right? I mean, even a school that tries to be value neutral, I mean, value neutrality is a value that that you're communicating. So schools are, are moral institutions and they send signals to their students and the school personnel in the schools about the values that are important. With private schools of choice, you get the opportunity for the family to select a school that's going to reinforce the value system that parents are trying to promote in their homes. And so we argue that this creates what James Hunter and Ryan Olson have characterized as a moral ecology, is a consistent and persistent messaging of values to students. And a lot of those messages have to do with the value of marriage and with sexual responsibility. So the biggest question that just jumps out at me is, is how are you controlling in this little experiment? I mean, the first thing I'm wondering about is, you know, what if your parents just raise you evangelical? You know, aren't you also in that case, you know, more likely to be in an intact marriage? And similarly, I mean, how do we sort of control for the selection bias of people for whom this moral ecology is so important that they're picking a school other than their public school? Sure. That's an excellent question, Naomi. This is a retrospective study. So we weren't able to randomly assign people to access to the various schools. They self-selected into them. And as you point out, in many cases, it may be that The association between, say, a Protestant school and better marriage outcomes is simply a function of a Protestant family with strong values about marriage sending their child to Protestant schools. So we can't rule that out as a factor, but we can control for a variety of baseline characteristics. We do control for the religious affiliation as children. We control for the extent to which they faced financial insecurity in childhood. We control for their parents' own marital status. So Mm -hmm. whether they grew up in a family with an intact marriage or not. So we can control for a lot of their childhood characteristics and the results don't change meaningfully when we control for those characteristics of their childhood. So we think that this evidence certainly suggests, it's suggestive evidence that the moral ecology of these types of private schools, particularly religious private schools, are reinforcing strong marital values that carry over into the life outcomes of these adults. So when within the category of public schools, does that category all assume these are parents that went to the school that was prescribed to them, or are there choice elements within public schools, for example, charter schools, are those embedded in that sample? Yes, Ian. I mean, we would love to be able to differentiate types of public schools, but we don't have that information in the in the data. 
So it's including some charter schools. They're all kind of mixed into the general category of Mm -hmm. public schools. So it's a catch-all. And that's a limitation of our analysis as well. I think it would be terrific to look at the effect of charter schools on marital outcomes because we know many charter schools that send strong moral messages, value-based messages to the students who are attending them. Yeah, because it'd be interesting to explore further just the idea of choice in particular as the key element. Yeah. I was interested in the part of the report where you were trying to explain why there seems to be such a big difference in the marriage outcomes between Catholic and Protestant schools, because I think a lot of people would have assumed that the Catholic schools would have also provided that kind of moral messaging about the importance of marriage and having children out of wedlock and, you know, those sorts of things. And so why is it that the Protestant schools seem to be more successful in getting that message across? Yeah, that's an excellent question. And we can only speculate about that because we just, we just don't have the granularity to examine that in detail. I think one, one finding that's particularly interesting that sheds some light on that is that the marriage outcomes associated with Catholic schooling are almost as good as strong for students who grew up in financial insecurity. They're almost as good for the Catholicly schooled than for the Protestantly schooled for that subcategory. And the, and the Protestantly schooled students also oddly enough, had stronger marriage outcomes if they reported having grown up in financial insecurity. I think part of it is a difference in how the two types of religious schools define their mission. You know, evangelical Protestant schools are strongly focused on imparting the theology and behavioral expectations of evangelical Protestantism, you know, biblically based values and behaviors. And they're unabashedly so. They promote a biblical view. You see it in their mission statements. We checked out a few mission statements of Protestant schools in our area, and they talk about promoting family life, family values, a biblical life for the young person. Catholic schools, I think, have defined their mission as more multifaceted, certainly a stronger focus on academic excellence in most Catholic schools compared to Protestant schools. And perhaps they aren't, they just aren't focusing as much on the moral message about the importance of marriage and the importance of of avoiding irresponsible sexual behaviors before marriage. I wonder though if there's a different kind of Catholic school that's catering to kids in financially insecure situations, which is that they are offering that message in a much stronger way. And maybe they can get away with offering that message in a much stronger way than they are in some kind of middle or upper middle class enclave where parents are much more interested in the academic message and don't need you or will tell you they don't need you telling their kids about getting married earlier in life or having or getting married before having children. Anyway, that's my hypothesis of the day. So, Naomi, I mean, one of my intellectual heroes is James Q. Wilson, the late great James Q. Wilson. And he claimed that organizations identify their critical environmental problem and try and solve them. And so for, say, you know, Catholic schools in the inner city, the critical environmental problem for the children they're serving is this idea of coming from a disadvantaged background, many of them coming from single parent families. And they may say, hey, our critical task is to impart values, strong values to these young people so that they develop the character traits to succeed where their, their parents were not able to. And that may be why we see the stronger marriage effects for Catholicly schooled adults if they grew up under financial insecurity. It, it could be that, that those Catholic schools really do promote a values-rich message, whereas you know, Catholic schools in the suburban area can feel that they need to focus more on academics. So Patrick, what do you think the implication is for public schools? I mean, this study shows that private schools, in particular Protestant and Catholic schools, have far better outcomes in this dimension. What's the implication? What can we learn and what's the implication for public schools? Sure, Ian. There's no doubt that private schools are better positioned to be values-rich environments because, you know, they are not politically controlled and they are schools of of choice. So they're voluntaristic communities where families come together in freedom because there is something about the school that that unifies them and attracts them. 
with public schools, they have a tougher road to hoe because they are politically controlled. They are designed to serve diverse communities with different value systems. And so they are faced with the challenge of communicating important values to their students. I don't think they can punt on that completely. They have to communicate important values to their students, and they're going to do it one way or the other, either by commission or by omission. But when they do that, it can be controversial. If a public school is stressing marriage is very important, it is a pathway to success in life, that it's the best circumstance for raising children is in the context of marriage, that bothers some people. It's considered controversial in some areas and public schools try to avoid controversy. So, you know, to the extent they avoid communicating values, I think they are failing to serve their students effectively to the extent to which, you know, they do, they have to be prepared to defend that approach to their political overseers. Well, I guess one option is if we are expanding the lessons here to public schools of choice, Parents can certainly gather around those common values, even outside of a religious tradition. Maybe that's what Ian's getting at. Yes, exactly. (laughs) Well, there's also the question of, is there curricula that could be adopted within the public school system that's adaptable that would help achieve the outcomes that you're speaking about? And does this study help to produce some fuel behind that? Right. Yeah, there are definitely curricula out there. Most of the curricula that promote marital values are religiously based. So the Catholic schools, many Catholic schools employ a curricula called the theology of the body. That's sort of standard sex education and moral instruction in many Catholic schools. Protestant schools have marriage-based sex ed curricula and human sexuality curricula that they use as well. There are you know, some curricula that are secular-based that emphasize the importance of marriage. And there's just plenty of sociological data that show people tend to live longer. They tend to be healthier, physically healthier. They tend to be financially healthier and more secure if they marry and stay married. So you you don't have to introduce a religious component to a pro-marriage messaging in schools, but that religious component, I think, makes the message stronger and deeper and perhaps helps it really resonate with young people. All right. Well, I think those are all the questions that we have time for today. So I encourage everyone to go check out the full report, which they can find at the AEI website. I think also at the Institute for Family Studies website. It's called the Protestant Family Ethic. What do Protestant, Catholic, private, and public schooling have to do with marriage, divorce, and non-marital childbearing? And we would like to, of course, thank Patrick Wolf for being our guest today. Patrick, good stuff. And thanks for, for listening to the latest episode of Are You Kidding Me? You can find this podcast on the AEI website, of course, or wherever you decide to download your podcast. Thanks again. Thank you.